سیدنا محمد ولا آلہ وصحاب اجمعین ڈسٹنگوش گیسٹس رسپیکٹڈ ایلڈرز برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو دس ایونٹ وی شیل بگن ان شاء اللہ وتھ دی ریسائٹیشن اینڈ دی ٹرانسلیشن آف دی ہولی قرآن آئی شیل کال اپون شیخ فیصل ٹو پروناؤنس دی ریسائٹیشن اینڈ کنٹینیو وتھ دی ٹرانسلیشن أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين وكان الله بكل شيء عليما يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا وسبحوه بكرة وأصيلا هو الذي يصلي عليكم وملائكته ليخرجكم من الظلمات إلى النور وكان بالمؤمنين رحيما تحيتهم يوم يلقونه سلام وأعد لهم أجرا كريما يا أيها النبي إنا أرسلناك شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا وبشر المؤمنين بأن لهم من الله فضلا كبيرا ولا تطع الكافرين والمنافقين ودع أذاهم وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا أن محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم is not the father of any of your men but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets and Allah has full knowledge of all things O you who believe celebrate the praises of Allah and do this often and glorify him in the morning and in the evening he it is who sends blessings on you as do his angels that he may bring you out from the depths of darkness into light and he is full of mercy to the believers. Their salutation on the day they meet him will be peace, and he has prepared for them a generous reward. O Prophet, truly we have sent thee as a witness, a bearer of glad tidings, and as a warner, and as one who invites to, to Allah's grace by his permission, and as a lamp spreading bright light. 
Then give the glad tidings to the believers that they shall have from Allah a very great bounty. And obey not what the believers, what the unbelievers do, and the hypocrites, and heed not their annoyances. But put your trust in Allah, for enough is Allah as a disposer of all affairs. And Allah has certainly revealed the truth. May Allah bless you. May Allah reward you. Thank you, Shaykh Faisal. Brothers and sisters, as you know, this program is being organized by IPCI in conjunction with Forum for Social Studies. At this juncture, before we proceed further, I would like you to join me in expressing and conveying our heartfelt condolences to Brother Tanvir Zaman, Sister Tasneem, Sister Thaseen, and Brother Tanzim for having lost our nearest and dearest auntie, that is their mother, who has been the source of inspiration for the whole of the family. She took over after father, that is our uncle Hassan Zaman, passed away many years ago. And she brought up the family, implanting by the grace of Allah in their heart the desire, the inborn sincerity to serve Islam. Please join me in praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless her, to reward her, and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his unbounded mercy upon her and grant her Jannah. Please join me in praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also to give the family and all concerned Sabri Jamil to overcome this great loss. Now we shall inshallah continue with our program. First speaker is very well known to you. He has been here on numerous occasions. A source of inspiration for many, including myself. Dr. Jamal Badawi, Professor of Management and Islamic Studies at St. Mary's University. President of the Islamic Information Foundation in Canada. He is the author and present, presenter of over a hundred two-hour programs on video, which have also been converted, as you may well be aware, in audio format, and are available from the IPCI Islamic Vision Shop on the ground floor. Dr. Badawi will start delivering his presentation on Qadr, fate, and predestination, and will continue with his chosen topic of dealing with difficult questions about Islam. Dr. Jamal Badawi. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa liyus salihin, wa ashadu anna sayyidana wa nabiyana wa habibana Muhammad al-Rasulullah صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته واهتدى بهداه إلى يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah, the sole creator, sustainer, and cherisher of the universe and may his peace and blessing be upon his last prophet and messenger Muhammad and upon all prophets and messengers who preceded him I greet you all with the greeting of all of the prophets, the greeting of peace Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which means may the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah Almighty be with you all. And I wish in the very beginning to thank the organizers, the Zaman family, and Brother Shamshad from IPCI, and all of you for honoring us, actually, honoring me, to allow me to stand between you this evening and share some thoughts. 
I'd like to take a permission first from uh, Brother Shamshad that since the topic on dealing with difficult questions is quite an involved one, so to avoid too much divergence of thought, I'll begin with that and we see what we do with, with time because that's the main topic really for my presentation. The topic, uh, especially with respect to the assault on the person of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a topic that is important in its own right and more important uh, in the world of the post-September 11. It is important in its own right because from the very beginning of the mission of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, unlike many of his brother prophets before, there have been detractors and there have been powers and interest groups who could not stand that Islam with the equality, justice, mercy that it, it's capable of bringing should be spread, especially those who benefit most from the oppressive situation in the world at the time of all of these prophets for that matter. I think it's a similar history that we find. In the case of Islam, there have been three pronged attack from the beginning that continued over the centuries for 1400 years. One is to attack the teachings of Islam itself. Secondly, is to attack the scripture of Islam, the Quran, in terms of both its authority as well as preservation and authenticity. And thirdly, an attack on the person who is not worshipped by Muslims, but a very important personality through whom that Quran, the revelation, was revealed, the last prophet as Muslim believe in, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So in that sense, these three pronged detraction is not new. It's actually recycled. It is more important in the post-September 11 world because we see again, like I said, recycling of some of these old new or new old type of um, questions raised about the integrity and the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Given the limited time we have, as we have to break just before Maghrib to resume again with the other fellow speakers, I'd like to focus more particularly on the Prophet. And even in the case of the Prophet, more specifically on two questions or objections raised that he could not qualify as a prophet because of them. The first, the way he treated non-Muslims, especially allegation that he persecuted, quote unquote, or massacred Jews in Medina because they rejected him as a prophet. And secondly, the question of his marriages. Let me begin first with his treatment of non-Muslims. And here again, we distinguish between two periods, just for the sake of ease and chronology. The Meccan period, the first 13 years of his mission, when Muslims were persecuted, and the Medinan period, the remaining 10 years of his mission. In Mecca, <laughs> we find that uh, the, his encounter included encounters with at least two groups. One is the idolatrous Arabs, the other is with Christians. As far as the encounter with idolatrous Arabs, we find that it is subdivided also into two types, positive and negative. By, that, by positive, we mean his encounter with those who rejected Islam but did not seek to hurt or undermine Islam or the Prophet and how he dealt with them. The best example for this is his uncle, Abu Talib. <coughs> Abu Talib did not accept Islam until his death. But 
he did not put obstacles before the prophet. He even defended the prophet and his right to preach what he believed in or claimed to have received as revelation. For that type of relationship, the prophet, peace be upon him, prophet Muhammad, more than reciprocated that courtesy. He loved his uncle in spite of his idolatrous beliefs so dearly. He respected him and he treated him with all kindness that is owed to a peaceful non-Muslim. But we have also the encounter in Mecca with those who showed aggressiveness and hurt the Prophet and Muslims and tortured them. There are many examples. Let me give you two. The first is one of his other uncles, Abu Jahl. In fact, it was reported that one time Abu Jahl passed by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he started abusing him verbally in a very, very ugly way. Then there was a young lady who was overhearing this kind of conversation or discussion. She kept watching what's happening. After Abu Jahl has his vile words against the Prophet, the Prophet simply looked at him but did not respond. A few minutes later, another uncle of the Prophet, Hamza, was coming from his hunting trips. And Hamza also, like Abu Jahl, did not believe or did not accept Islam and follow the Prophet. Then he passed by that young lady and she tells him, Hamza, do you realize what happened to your nephew, Muhammad? He said, what? He said, Abu Jahl abused him so badly. He said, what did Muhammad وسلم, do or say? He said he didn't reciprocate with evil words. He just left him, he just left, moved away from him. It was that nobility of the Prophet in the face of abuse, which is one of his characteristics, that softened the heart of Hamza. And that was actually the turning point in his life. Hamza, he was a very husky, strong, and aggressive person by nature, actually. He walked right to the Kaaba, where Abu Jahl was sitting with the chieftains of Quraysh. And he hit him with his bow on his head, caused him an injury. And he said, you abuse Muhammad. I say what he says, and I follow his religion. You can see the magic of kindness vis-a-vis uh, responding to evil with evil. The second example is amazing in itself. How to deal even with those who are aggressors. At least one form of dealing. There are various ways. And that was when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, being persecuted and rejected in Mecca. Sought to find some followers and a base, a secure base, to preach the word of God as he received it and believed in it. So he goes to a nearby township known as at taif He goes there to talk to people, invite them to monotheism and so on. And then he's mocked first by adults. I'll give you an example of mockery. One of the people in at taif tells him, huh, you're telling me that you're a prophet? It is either you are a liar or truthful. And if you're a liar, I don't want to listen to a liar. And if you're truthful and you're indeed a prophet, oh, you're too big for me to sit and listen to. You can't win. But then it didn't stop at that. They send their children and instigate them against the prophet. They start pelting him with stones start bleeding, blood goes into his sandals, and then he takes refuge in a wall of a garden that belongs to a couple of Christians, brothers, 
and he sits there making his earnest prayer to Allah that if you are not angry with me oh Allah I don't care meaning I don't care for this suffering in the middle of all of that pain physical and psychological he says the angel of God came to him and he said for those arrogant people if it's okay with you God has permitted me we could simply crush them between these two mountains most humans perhaps would be thinking of vengeance it's part of human nature that need to be controlled and the Prophet showed us how to control and the Prophet answered the angel and he tells him no because I hope to Allah that out of these people's descendants their children there will be people who will worship him and that was very prophetic this is exactly what happened later and then he made a very noble statement the same statement that is attributed to another noble prophet who immediately came before Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him but about six centuries before Prophet Jesus peace be upon him which shows that what these prophets were teaching is coming from the same light not they're copying from one another they are receiving from the same source of inspiration from God he said oh God oh Allah forgive my people for they know not what they're doing forgive my people for they know not what they're doing the second encounter with Christians in this early days even when the persecution of Muslim for their faith including people who were martyred because of their faith became very hard and difficult to bear you know what the Prophet tells his followers before even the major migration to Medina he tells them you go to Abyssinia migrate there and then he started to praise a Christian he said there is a king there a Christian king in whose realm people are not wronged so he's praising him not necessarily for his belief because he doesn't share this belief for example in Trinity and so on but he's praising one human quality in that Abyssinian Christian king that is fair and just praising him now one observation that good relationship and courtesy continued not only when Muslims were persecuted when Muslims even became powerful and had their own state and base in Medina later we never hear about the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him ordering for example the invasion of Abyssinia and that fly in the face of mistaken interpretation that some even Muslim may have that it is the duty of Muslims to fight all people in the world until they accept Islam or at least come under the rule of Islam if this were true the first implementer of that would have been the Prophet himself there is no record whatsoever and that shows as I'll be showing later that when Islam allowed fighting either for self-defense or against oppression it was not meant to include people who are not Muslims but coexisting peacefully with Muslims this is a clear lesson that we know from the life of the Prophet peace be upon him now we go to his encounters in Medina when Muslims already migrated and he migrated with them to Medina here we find multiple encounters with non-Muslims with the Jews with Christians and with idolatrous Arabs as a whole let's see how he dealt with each of these situations and what kind of developments took place with Jews <coughs> one of the first three major acts of the Prophet peace be upon him upon moving to Medina beside the body system the brotherhood between the migrants and settlers and also the building of the mosque as a center not only for prayers for everything for Muslims 
but the third act was known as as sahifa which can be described as Dr. Muhammad Hamidullah, may Allah bless his soul, call it perhaps the first multicultural, multi-religious, pluralistic constitution in the world that guaranteed equal rights for everybody irrespective of their faith. Because in that sahifa or constitution that everybody was a signatory to, it was agreed that Muslims, irrespective of their tribes, irrespective whether they are migrants or settlers in Medina, are to be regarded as one community united by faith. The same equal treatment were given to the various Jewish tribes. There were various tribes also. That all Jews in Medina, irrespective of their tribes, are to be regarded also as one community of faith united by their Judaism. Secondly, the Sahifa or constitution guaranteed full rights and autonomy and freedom of worship and belief to everyone, Jews and Muslims and everyone else for that matter. Number three, it was agreed also that Jews and Muslims should be co-defenders of Medina. Should any enemy attack Medina, both are obligated as two communities to stand together against any aggression and never to help any enemy attacking Medina. Fourthly, that no side should give refuge to someone who committed a crime. You don't take refuge in one community. Ni neither can give refuge. Okay? That was an amazing liberal kind of treatment and approach and reaching out to what the Quran called people of the book, applying to Jews and Christians, especially people of the book, because of this there's a great deal of affinity in their relationship with Muslims, both the three normally called Abrahamic religion, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, share the belief in the one God. They might see or believe in God in different ways, but they all believe in the oneness of God. Revelation, scripture, prophets, responsibility for our deeds, moral code for life. Lots, there are differences, but there are lots of common themes also that unite these people. And may, may I add also one more point that should be added. That all parties, including the Jewish tribes in Medina, all agreed that the head of the whole community would be the prophet. So you have autonomy and the religious practice and everything, but to have any organized society or a state, the head was accepted by all to be Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, <clears throat> what happened later, unfortunately, is that especially three tribes, one tribe after the other, broke this agreement of peaceful coexistence and mutual respect and en engaged in hostilities towards Muslims in some degree or the other. The Prophet in his position and responsibility as the enforcer of the law, the constitution of Medina, to which everybody signed, he had the responsibility to apply fair punishment and proportionate punishment to whoever committed an offending act. However, there are a number of observations about the approach and the fairness of the Prophet in dealing with the offending people. Number one, it is impossible to think of any punitive action against those who broke the law as anti-Semitism. It is silly to say anti-Semitism because Prophet Muhammad himself is a pure Semite. He's a descendant of Ishmael. Arabs, true Arabs, original Arabs, are more pure Semites than some Jews who converted to Judaism later on who came from even non-Semite origins. So it's almost like saying anti-Semite, Semite. There's no reason. Secondly, it is impossible to think that this punitive action against offenses was anti-Jewishness. And why anti-Jewishness if the Quran mentioned the name of Prophet Moses a lot more than the name of Prophet Muhammad himself? And the Quran describes the original Torah, Torah 
giving to Moses as one that contains light and guidance. The recognition is there. It could not be anti-Jewishness. Thirdly, it is impossible to think of these punishments as punishment for people because they rejected him as a prophet. He was hoping they would follow him, but they rejected him. Why? Because the prophet and Muslims are prohibited by the text of the Quran in many verses. One is the chapter 2, verse 256, let there be no compulsion in religion. The freedom of conscience and worship is guaranteed in several places in the Quran. With this background of what is not, let's see what was in terms of proper approach to enforcement of the law. Number one, the prophet never stereotyped and lump all the Jews together when it comes to punishment. They were together in terms of their rights, their unity and religion, that's fine. But they were never together when punishment was inflicted. Only the offending tribe was punished, not the others. And that's significant, because if you're anti group of people, you tend to lump them like the kind of treatment Muslims are being subjected to, especially in North America. You lump everybody together. No, only the tribe that committed the offense. Secondly, the punishment for the offense was always, always proportionate to the offense that was committed. For example, without getting into great details, in the case of Banu Qaynuqa, it was a major offense, but in the case of Banu Nadir, the next incident, the offense was much greater, including conspiracy to kill the Prophet. And in the case of Banu Quraiza, it was what we call today in modern legal language, high treason at the time of war. We said earlier, and that's what we'd like to focus a little bit more on because they were, of course, fatalities in this kind of punishment. We mentioned earlier that one of the clauses of the constitution of Medina is that both Jews and Muslims defend Medina against invaders or attackers, that none should cooperate with the enemy against their fellow Medinaites people living in Medina and its surrounding. And then we know historically, and you read the most authentic reference on that, the seerah of Ibn Ishaq, that the Arabs, when they lost hope of really trying to destroy the Prophet, they tried to gather a huge army, a coalition of various tribes, not limited anymore to the Meccan people, a huge army, 10,000 strong. They surrounded Medina with the view of trying to wipe out the Muslims. Now Muslims and Jews were li living side by side in Medina. Yet, information were relayed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that there have been contacts between the invading army and the chief and of the tribe of Banu Quraiza in, in order to get rid of Muhammad as a problem for them and for them also, for, for the pagan Arabs as well as for the Jews. In fairness, Ibn Ishaq says that in the beginning when that offer was made uh, or encouragement to the chief of the tribe of Banu Quraiza, he hesitated. And look at his words and acknowledgement. He says, Ma alimna min Muhammadin illa wafa'a. When another fellow Jew who was also ahead of another tribe tried to say, that's your chance. Muhammad and Muslim do not chance, do not stand any chance. They will be finished. So you better join. In the beginning he said, no, we have never seen from Muhammad except faithfulness, meaning respect of his agreement. So he did hesitate. But apparently he was tempted and he, you know, in these tribes, when they make a decision, it's not the decision of the chief. They were quite democratic. It's at least people of fighting age, the adults would meet and discuss a very important issue like that. And it appears that the consensus finally that yes, Muhammad never betrayed his treaty, but he doesn't stand a chance. So let's join hands. The prophet wanted to make sure not to jump to conclusions. So he sent an emissary to talk to the leaders of that tribe, 
to see whether this information is correct or not, not just to jump the gun on the basis of claims of imminent dangers as you hear today in recent times. He wanted to make absolutely sure. And he goes and talks that emissary. And you tell him, is it true, the treaty that we have? And he said, what treaty? What treaty? They come back and relay the information that it is true. It is coming through the horse's mouth. The treaty is no longer respected or acknowledged by that tribe. But then they say it was the prophet who ordered the execution of the fighting men. In fact, this is a great falsification of history. And in fact, if the prophet even did that, it would have been perfectly his authority. He's been accepted by all, part, all parties as the head of the state. And here you have a case of high treason at the time of war when everybody was in danger, Muslims in particular, and you get a stab in the back from within. What would any state do, any head of a state do in a case like, it would have been his authority even if he ordered the capital punishment for those responsible for that betrayal. But in fact, he didn't even use that authority. Was, when he was besieged by the head of hypocrites, Ibn Salul, he suggested that the, that tribe, the offending tribe, chooses its own arbitrator. Its own arbitrator. And whatever decision he comes up with, it is binding. Well, I happen, like Brother Shamshad said, that I teach not only Islamic studies, I teach also management, more particularly industrial relations. And I know, like many of you also in the legal profession, that when you talk about arbitration as opposed to conciliation or mediation, arbitration means that you choose someone who is mutually accepted by both parties. Yet the Prophet was so generous and so lenient that he says, you choose your own arbitrator. And they did. And you know how they chose? They chose a man by the name of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. And why they chose him? Because he was their ally before Islam came to Medina. He was very close to them. And he was familiar with their Torah and their system, even though he was not a Jew himself. They, they chose him. And Sa'd ibn Mu'adh stands there and addresses both the Prophet and Muslims, as well as the Jews, the, the, this particular tribe, Banu Quraiza. And he's basically trying to get approval from them that if I come up with a decision, would everybody abide by it? And by the way, he, he need not ask that question. Again, anyone in industrial relation or law you know that arbitration is final and binding. There could be no challenge for the arbitrator's decision, even in modern legal systems, unless there is a proof of bribery or violation of basic rules of common law, like refusing to hear evidence and so on. But otherwise, you don't say the arbitrator granted us 5% increase in pay, uh, but uh, we don't agree, so we're not going to implement it. No, once you agree to arbitration, you know that the decision is final and binding. This is very clear and acceptable principle. And Sa'd ibn Mu'ad stands there and says to the, uh, the tribe of Banu Quraiza, I'm going to rule on you in accordance of your own Torah, in accordance with your own Torah, which provide, of course, for capital punishment, at least for fighting men. The women and children were spared. Yet they keep saying the Prophet massacred. It is true that the Prophet agreed with his uh, judgment, but he didn't have a choice to agree. It was an arbitration decision that everybody agreed to accept. So I hope that this clarifies some of those distortions that sometimes we hear in the media or some other writings. A second encounter with Christians. Here again we find the positive and negative. Even in the case of Jews, they have been the positive and negative. They were good relationship at one point until they started breaking the agreement. So every situation was dealt with accordingly. With Christians, also there was the positive and negative. Example of the positive, when the Christians of Najran, the, the region of Najran, which is now in Yemen, sent their emissaries to find out about Islam and talk to the Prophet, peace be upon him, he was so courteous with them, he received them cheerfully, and you know where he took them? He hosted them in his own mosque. In his own mosque. And he let them speak freely about their beliefs, he answered their question, and so on. Some narrators say that at one point in this discussion, the Christian group said, can we be excused to go out? He says, why is that? He said, we want to do our prayers. He said, you're welcome to do it here. Imagine 
the hospitality that he showed to, the, to his guests. In fact, we know historically that there have been instances where some of those Christian groups, there were several who came to see him, actually accepted Islam. And the Quran seemed to refer to that because when they accepted Islam, they were rebuked by the Meccan uh, idolatrous people and the Quran report them as saying, peace be with you, you know, for us, our deeds, to you, your deeds. We seek no argument with those who are ignorant. The Quran actually make reference. So they were cases of very positive interaction, aside from what happened, of course, in, in Mecca, in terms of their relationship with Abyssinia. But then there was also the negative, and it has to be dealt with. There were cases when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sent memorizers of the Quran in order to teach the Quran to certain tribes, they were killed. There were cases of a Christian king, Assassinites. You know, Assassinites were the uh, uh, tribe of Arabs in the northern part of Arabia because of their proximity to Byzantium, they became Christian. And one of their kings, the Prophet sent an emissary to him, he kills him. And there was another case. And we know, of course, in international law today, to deliberately kill an ambassador of another country is an act of what? It's an act of war. It's not just against one particular person. But it went beyond that to gathering, to the gathering of a huge army, a huge army from the Byzantine Empire, of course, who could not, whose rulers and emperors could not stand the religion that says everybody's free in the sight of God. All of us are slaves of God. God is the only master calling for equality. Like some of them used to say, even this religion is going to turn our slaves against us. And the Prophet did march, actually, to the place which is called Tabuk. Tabuk now is a city in the northern part of Saudi Arabia. But fortunately, the, uh, the Byzantine army dispersed and there was no battle. So there were cases also where battle took place. And later on, when aggression again was repeated or was prepared for, it was aborted also by action against aggression. And there is no bones about it. The Quran is quite clear that you have only two reasons to go to the battlefield. And some of you might have heard the, um, the BBC Asia radio. There was an interview with Sheikh Abdullah Hakim and myself. It was made clear there that um, so long as people are living and coexisting in peace, you have no right to fight against them. The two reasons for fighting in the battlefield or jihad, the combative type of jihad, which is one of many, is either aggression or oppression. The Quran is quite clear. In chapter 2, verses 190 through 194, it begins by saying, fight in the way of God those who fight against you but commit no excesses or aggression for God doesn't love the aggressor or those who commit excess. It can be translated both ways. Second reason is found a couple of verses after. Fight until there is no more oppression and religion belongs to God. That means there will be freedom of religion for Muslims and others as well. These are the only reasons. And when there were cases, and there were cases of oppression and aggression, that justified, again, fighting against them to protect peace and to protect freedom as well. The third encounter, we talked about Jews, Christians, encounter with Arabs. You know the tribal society in Arabia one has to understand that it was a very violent world in which Islam was born. If you read the book by Karen Armstrong about the life of the Prophet, she had an in a very interesting statement in which she said, she says that Islam was born in a very violent world. You know, all this rivalry between the Byzantian and the Persian and all of this. And you didn't have Kofi Annan or United Nations if they were good enough for stopping conflict even. There was nothing like that. So, to survive, you've got to deal with the situation as it arises. But the Prophet tried again to avoid bloodshed. How did he do that? He used to send expeditions to the tribes surrounding Medina. Why? Because there is a great fear that they might come under pressure and intimidation even from the dominant Meccan tribe of Quraysh to join forces with them against Muslims. In some cases, some of those people said, look, Muhammad, peace be upon him, we give you our word. We're not going to fight against you. We're not going to help anyone 
fighting against you. In other words, a mutual, you know, peaceful relationship with you. The Prophet never said, no, but you have to come under our control or rule. And this is known actually as a term, technical term, muada'a. You say, sara ilayhim wa wada'u. Muada'a means having a peaceful agreement, leave them alone, but will not touch you. The motto of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in his reach out to these tribes is very interesting as you compare it with Mr. Bush's statement. He said, basically, I mean, his approach can be summed up. If you're not with us, don't hurt us. Not an arrogant, tyrannical, undemocratic statement. If you're not with us, you're with the enemy. That's undemocratic. It doesn't give me a chance to say I am against the enemy and against your rash policy and deception. Can't you take that position? No, no you're not entitled with us or with the enemy and the enemy uh, are terrorists, so you're a terrorist and terrorists can be killed anywhere. If you're not with us, don't hurt us. See the fairness. And we're talking 1400 years before the civilized uh, time that we are living in today. But then there were aggression also. In the case of Arabs like Jews and Christian, this was the positive. There was the negative also, and it has to be dealt with for Muslim to survive, or else Islam would have been, as the Arabs say, kana, would have disappeared totally from the face of the earth. And assault after assault was made against Muslims by the Meccan Arabs and their allies. The Prophet was giving the permission for the first time, not in Mecca, in Medina, and later in Medina, to fight, to fight back, to preserve their existence and defend their survival, which is a basic human right for anyone. No wonder, as the commentators of the Quran indicate, that the first verse that was revealed in the Quran that ever gave permission for Muslim to fight back is in Surah Al-Hajj, that's chapter 22 in the Quran, which says permission has been given to the believers, those who have been oppressed, that indeed wrong has been done to them, that Allah is able to give them victory. The first ever that gave permission. And by the way, some interesting remark. One time I was discussing with a Christian friend of mine, and he said, look, your prophet engaged in a battlefield. Yet, Prophet Jesus, or Jesus, never lifted a finger even and maintained his peace throughout his mission. I asked him, how long was the mission of Jesus? He said, most scholars say, three years. He said, indeed, we love Jesus, we believe in him, and he should get credit for withholding his hands and asking his followers to withhold their hands for a complete three years under persecution. But don't you also give credit to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that he withheld his hand for 13 years, not three years, 13 years in Mecca, before even permission came to fight back in Medina. And the situation was different from the time of Jesus to the time of Prophet Muhammad. Again, you cannot compare the two situations historically and put them in the same uh, bag. Here I'd like to indicate one thing. A particular incident that was very important in terms of the shaping of the Muslim etiquette in the battlefield that unfortunately many including some Muslims. No apology, the Quran says you have to say the truth even if it's against yourself or your close kins. Many Muslims even have grossly misinterpreted that reference in the Quran. How many times have you heard in polemical literature and assaults on Islam and all, in all media that the Quran teaches hatred and violence it sanctions it, it even commands its followers because they say the Quran say, go and kill the unbeliever wherever you find them. Is there anyone here who hasn't heard that yet? I'm sure you've heard it. Islam say, go and kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. First of all, first mistake or distortion. It doesn't say unbelievers. 
those who know Arabic, it says al-mushrikeen. And mushrikeen is a term that has never been applied as a title for the people of the book. It has been used in this context to refer to idolatrous Arabs. Mistake two. It, the verse in chapter 9, verse 5, is taken totally out of context, historical and textual. How historical? I'll give you the background. After the Muslims migrated to Medina, in about the sixth year after migration to Medina, Muslims wanted to go back for pilgrimage. And that might have been also intended as a peaceful gesture towards the Meccans, that they're coming for worship, not for fight. Every sign and every precaution was made that they appear to be coming only for pilgrimage. They're not coming with arms and, you know, all the shields and so on. They were stopped, intercepted and stopped at the outskirts of Mecca. Muslims were irritated that they're preventing them from reaching the house of their father Abraham, the Kaaba, and were ready to fight. And the Prophet, and that was his characteristic, by the way, whenever it was possible to have a just peace, he never opted for battlefield. He said, no, by God, if they negotiate anything with me that maintains the peace and keep the kinship relationship, I will respond positively to that. The pagan Arabs came with great arrogance. A negotiation took place, and they showed a great deal of arrogance and unfairness yet the Prophet accepted. But some of the important provisions in this treaty is that there will be peace for 10 years, no fighting between either side. And that indeed was the major thing that the Prophet was looking after, was looking at. There were other concessions Muslim gave that sounded unfair to them. But the main thing the Prophet was interested in is to remove the barrier of communication between human beings. And indeed, it is very interesting to note that within nearly a year and a half, a year and a half of peaceful relationship where people can communicate without this hatred and stereotypes, more people entered into the fold of Islam than those who entered in the previous 19 years of conflict. More people in that year and a half than 19 years. And historically speaking, Islam spread much faster during the period of peace, not conflict and hatred. Right until this moment, when Muslims' situation is pathetic in every respect, Islam continues to spread, so long as there is communication between human beings. No wonder Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to say, please, khallu bayni wa bayna nas please let me communicate with people. When he was in Mecca, they tried to prevent people even from listening to him. The Quran quotes them, say, don't listen to this Quran and make noise to have the upper hand. They intercept the pilgrims who are coming because Arabs also used to do pilgrimage in, in spite of their paganistic ideas. They intercept them and warn them, don't talk to Muhammad. He's a magician. He's a dangerous man. And why? They didn't want people to listen to him. Now, when that took place, like I said, the Islam spread, but apparently some elements did not like that at all. And all of a sudden, unexpectedly, the aggression come against Muslims and their allies, and some people are killed, called bloodedly at night. Who broke the treaty? The other side, not the Prophet. The Prophet respected every iota of his agreement. Now these are murderers, and what is the punishment of called blooded murder on that scale, execution. There's no question. I know people have different feeling and views, but even states today differ as to whether the, the uh, execution as a punishment is inhuman or not. There are countries that accept that as well. Now, it is in the context of this event that the Quran refers the, the event and what followed later on in instigation for another battle, even after Mecca was opened that the Quran speaks about those who deserve to be killed because they are like war criminals. They are like war criminals. It is only those that the Quran speaks that in, in the battlefield, you kill them wherever you find them because they deserve it. It is a just punishment for them. 
And to show that this is the correct way of understanding it, you go and read not only one part of an ayah, 9-5, the famous one, but read the entire section from verse 1 to 13 or 15. And you find the reason given. Number one, it excludes, even among the pagan Arabs, the Meccan people, it excludes exclude those who respected their treaty and never betrayed the Prophet. Number two, it gives the very reason why Muslims were allowed to fight them, because they say, وَهُمْ بَدَأُوكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً They started, they were the ones who started aggression against you in the first place. Number three, the Quran itself says, لَا يَرْقُبُونَ فِي مُؤْمِنٍ إِلَّا وَلَا ذِمَّةً They never observe any kinship, relationship, or even treaty that they have signed. So it is obvious, it is not a general statement about any non-Muslim. It is not a statement about all idolatrous Arabs. It is only against those criminals who committed the cold-blooded murder. Another or further proof is found in the Quran itself. The two verses that many scholars consider the constitution of the normal relationship between Muslims and peacefully coexisting non-Muslims. They appear in chapter 60, verses 8 and 9, that basically says any non-Muslim, Jew, Christian, you, know, you name it, pagan even, those who do not fight you because of your religion as Muslims or drive you out of your homes, take away your rights, your basic rights, and oppress you, you should deal with them in justice and birr. Birr is not just kindness because it is the same term used in the Quran and Hadith to designate the nature of one's relationship with his or her hmm? parents. And relationship with parents is not only justice and kindness, but love and respect. Even if you don't share certain beliefs, the basic love as, as a human being and respect are included. It is not by chance that God chose that particular term to designate how to relate to those who mean no ill to you and not oppressing you. Moving on to the second issue of marriage, there are four basic issues that arise. One, they say, how could Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, be accepted as a prophet? If he married several women, if he, were, if he was a polygamous person, that excludes him from being a prophet, just somebody obsessed with women. But before I give any answer, as John Esposito and others point out, that this is indeed a sort of double standard. Because some of those who raise those objections believe in the Bible and believe in various prophets in the Bible, and most of the prophets in the Bible have more than one wife. In fact, David is said to have had 100 wives, Solomon much more. And that's why, according to Edward Westermark, this is a very interesting reference about the history of human marriage, which is the title of his book. Westermark, it's W-E-S-T-E-R-M-A-C-K, Edward Westermark, History of Human Marriage. And he makes a very powerful argument that he says, insofar as the text of the Bible, both Hebrew scripture and New Testament, there is no single, positive, clear, unequivocal statement that prohibits the existing polygamy that was accepted in Jewish law and accepted also and practiced by many Israelite prophets. None, not one. And then he quotes Martin Luther. And he says that, Martin Luther says that God did not forbid it. He says, even the friend of God, Abraham, had more than one wife. He had, of course, Sarah and Hagar, of course, it is said also that he married Keturah after the death of Sarah. And he further refers to the fact that Jews in the Middle East, even for seven centuries after Islam, that's up to the 14th century, used to practice polygamy. Furthermore, I was surprised to find that he says there is evidence also that the church in medieval times, Christian church, did officiate multiple marriages for some of the kings of Europe at the time. Basically, the issue here boils to same standard, not more, not less. If the fact that a prophet married more than one wife disqualify him as a prophet, then all of them are disqualified. If it is not itself a disqualification, why pick on one particular prophet? Secondly, it is unfortunate that a lot of times when you give people uh, a list of words on both sides to connect lines, and you put Islam on one side and polygamy on the other, automatically, the lines are drawn, that as if Islam 
and polygamy are the twin that shall never part. This is totally false. It is known historically that polygamy was practiced, or polygyny to be more accurate, by many nations, by many people, as I indicated again from Western Mark, including Christians, including Jews. There are some Christians until today even, like the Mormons who accept the notion of polygamy. It is there. In fact, we must say positively that among the three Abrahamic religions, Islam is the only Abrahamic religion that for the first time in its own scripture had an unequivocal clear limitation on the free practice of polygamy by limiting the number of wives to a maximum of four, by requiring the ability to spend on them, by requiring justice in treating all of them, which was quite open without any restriction, without any guidelines. Islam is the only one to introduce restriction. We don't find that unequivocally and clearly in neither the Hebrew scripture or the New Testament. Furthermore, some people might wonder again why Islam did not outlaw it totally. Even though monogamy, if you read the Quran and see the norm, really it assumed actually that monogamy is, is the norm. But that's flexibility that's needed with the variation of time, place, and circumstances. Take some reason, recent examples. In Srebrenica, when under the nose of United Nations, nearly, I was told by Bosnians, it's not eight or nine or 7,000, 10,000 Bosnian Muslims, men and teenagers or boys, have been slaughtered. That creates a great deal of imbalance for a certain period of time. In Afghanistan, it is even worse. During the Soviet invasion, nearly one million plus died. Then you get large number of widows, large number of orphans, young girls who are looking for marriage. In an sit abnormal situation like that, with the agreement of parties involved, of course, the, everybody has a recourse to that. There's no force in this. To look after those widows and their orphans, not just to give a handout, is a much more humane and moral type of solution. In fact, it's much more moral as a form of marriage than what we hear about today, same-sex marriage. It's much more than that. It's much more moral from a Muslim perspective than claiming false monogamy officially and having 12 sweethearts in illicit relationship, no protection for them, no recognition of the legality of their children. But let's focus on the Prophet now. I just wanted to give that as a basic background that one of the most subtle attacks on the Prophet when the people speak tongue in cheek about, hmm, you know, at one point he had 11 wives altogether. Of course, there is some kind of hidden message there. I, either there is something wrong with his morality or possibly obsession with women. But mind you, the interesting thing is that not even the worst critic of the Prophet could point out to a single, a single instance of sexual indiscretion. Whereas the, some of the people who raise these objections read in the Bible, which by the way, Muslims don't accept this part, that some prophets committed incest, some, some prophets committed adultery. Read the story of David and others. From a Muslim perspective, the Quran negated that anyway. But from their perspective, that's the case, they can find a fault, a single fault, with the Prophet ﷺ, Prophet Muhammad, so they start talking about mm, many wives at the same time. Furthermore, it defies logic to describe him as a polygamous prophet. If we know historically that out of 37 years of marital life, not all his life, he died at the age of 63. He married at the age of 25. So his marital, just if you restrict it to marital life, 37 years. 25 years, it was at 25 years, at least, actually, some add a couple of more years. 25 years at least, he was monogamous. That is more than two thirds of his marital life. So, all of this period of monogamy is forgotten, and people are focusing only on what scholars actually believe to have been in the last seven years of his life, from mid 50s, about 56 to 63, when he had so many wives. But all of the monogamous period seem to have been forgotten. Furthermore, it is not any part of his life, not any seven years. If somebody was obsessed or were obsessed with women, 
the time for that, and again, with my apology to the brothers here, the time of that is not in the mid 50s and early 60s. Things slow down quite a bit once you reach that. If you're really obsessed, that's not the time for it. But if we look carefully about the nature of his marriages, you would be amazed about the humane aspect of it. Not only was the Prophet known for his chastity, even before he got married, in a society that were very promiscuous, to the point that he narrates the story himself. He said, twice, I was invited to attend a wedding, not to commit any adultery or fornication like young people in his age, just wedding. And he says, in both instances, God caused me to sleep. I hear some music in my ear. I fell asleep to wake up next morning with the sun shining in my eye, as if Allah wanted to keep him away even from an atmosphere of drinking and evil, the party type of atmosphere. And if indeed, logically, there was a single error or a slip on the part of the Prophet, and he had so many enemies in Mecca who wanted to discredit him by any means, would I have been kept silent? The whole world would have heard about it. And nobody could ever raise an issue about his chastity. But then, if you look at the marriages of the Prophet, and again, I'll give you a reference for more details. On the internet, there is, as Brother Shamshad indicated, there is 352 half-hour TV programs, a series called Islam in Focus or Islamic Teaching. You can access it through islamicity.com. You just go to multimedia and radio, and then under radio, there is a channel, a whole channel devoted to that, it's RA200. And look under Prophet, Last Messenger of God. There are detailed information about each and every of those marriages. I understand the tapes also might be obtainable through the IPCI on, on cassette format. And people also who are running the Islam online, one word, Islam online, promise to put it for free also, uh, unlike the Islamic city, which might require some subscription. In any case, there are details, but let me sum it up for you that the marriages can be classified into four. Why multiple marriages? One, the Prophet married and gave in marriage also his daughters to people who were the closest supporter of him who happened to be the senior companions, who happened also to be the first four caliphs after him. For example, he married the daughter of Abu Bakr, Aisha, the daughter of Umar, Hafsa. He gave his daughter in marriage to Uthman, and when she died, her sister also was married to Uthman. And he gave his youngest daughter, Fatima, to Ali. So that intermingling or intermarriage with those who were supporter of him, bonding with them, was a very, very crucial in that difficult stage in the Muslim life. Secondly, a category of marriages was intended to give example to other Muslims, like I was talking about Afghanistan or Serbinitia, to care for those who lost their husbands, to care for them and for their orphan children. I'll give you just one example. Umm Salama was a very dignified woman. She was maybe close to the age of the Prophet. Her husband died as a result of injuries sustained in one of the defensive battles of Muslims. The woman was left with four orphan children to look after. So one of the companions of the Prophet, the most senior, Abu Bakr, goes to her to offer marriage to her. The woman was so dignified. Maybe she figured out who would like to marry a woman in menopause in her mid-50s probably with four orphan children. She knew that this is a sympathy offer. She said no. Then another companion, Omar, goes to offer marriage to her. She said, no. When the Prophet heard that, that the two most senior companions were turned down, he felt sympathy to her and her children. So he goes to her, to Umm Salama, and offer marriage to her. And she said, no, messenger of God. And he asked her, why not? She said, three reasons. One, I am an old woman. In other words, why are you marrying? I'm an old woman. Two, I have four orphan children to look after. Three, I am a jealous woman. She cannot be blamed. No woman would like anyone to share her husband, no matter how circumstances. I mean, it's human nature. So the Prophet, in his decency and kindness, tells her, as far as age, I am older than you. He might have been marginally older, older than her, but look at his gentleness. You tell any woman, I am older than you, MashaAllah, she's soothed in her agony. Secondly, as far as the orphan children, don't worry. 
they would be like my own I'd be responsible for their sustenance and as far as your jealousy I pray to Allah to remove it from your heart and Allah indeed removed that jealousy from her heart and she accepted the honor of being a wife of the Prophet in that age and in fact she was a very wise advisor to the Prophet as the famous incident in the battle of her, or the treaty of, of Hudaybiyah she had a very good role being a senior sort of advisor and helper to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him so this is just one example of many the third category of marriages were intended and by the way this is this was not unusual in the tribal society or even among prophets in the past that in order to remove the hatred and conflict with other tribes you marry from them it has been used as a very if you call it political marriage call it political marriage if that would result in saving the blood of people and removing the need for war and conflict and we find numerous examples the prophet marries from the tribes of those who showed enmity to him one example um habiba she was the daughter of abu sufyan you know in the film about the message they call him sufyan you know but actually it's abu sufyan you know he was an, an the arch enemy of the prophet yet he married his daughter his daughter accepted islam and married the prophet and you know abu sufyan actually when he heard that he was very happy he was happy he knew that this is a good man himself it's just the you know vested interest that was causing him to fight against the spread of islam and that might have contributed to the softening of the heart of abu sufyan who eventually accepted islam the prophet married a woman from a christian background more than one woman from jewish background after he gave them their freedom after they were captured and they accepted to marry him what is the problem with this some historian actually say that some of the tribe that used to show a great deal of enmity toward muslims and were engaged in some atrocities or conflict when the prophet married from them some accepted islam others were at least neutralized so what's wrong with that to forge this relationship and prevent bloodshed in his position of course as the symbol of islam and community and finally there was also a case of legal precedent removal of a taboo that no one else would be fit for that but the prophet god willing and mentioned that in the very end and the end is coming clear so we'll move to a third question or objection about the marriages of the prophet and probably you heard about that especially in the united states you might have heard the statements made in the southern baptist convention i can't repeat even the nasty words that were used but basically they say it is reported in muslim sources that the prophet had the marital contract on aisha at the age of six and she moved to his household at the age of nine i.e a big an old man in his 50s marrying a child and of course you know what kind of words uh, go or has gone with this first of all the issue of difference in age is not a problem we know many happy marriages very productive marriages with big difference in age of course it's nice to have closer or closeness of age but that's not in itself a criteria so that's uh, i mean nobody cares much about that anymore unless of course you get a, a 99 years old person marrying a 16 years old maybe extreme cases might be questionable but difference is not an issue itself the issue really is uh, how abominable they say for a man you know to have a contract at that young age and moving at the age of nine to his household first of all if indeed there was anything that is regarded as abominable among the enemies of the prophet in mecca because that wedding took place or at least the contract not consummation took place in the later years of the uh, meccan period if indeed that was the case his enemies would have raised all kind of questions and tried to discredit him for marrying such a young girl and to the surprise of many of you do you know that aisha was engaged before the prophet to another man what does that say that within that society in the arabian society marriage here in the very early age does not necessarily means automatically consummation sometimes you could even marry a child your son three years old to be married to my daughter who's two years old but it's, it's basically like engagement it's almost like saying we're so close as tribes or clans that we want to reserve your son for my daughter or whatever what islam did actually is to improve on that practice by considering 
a marital contract possible at any age. However, once the two parties, the girl and boy, reach adolescence, then they can decide whether that contract is acceptable or not. So it's a conditional contract on reaching maturity or majority and deciding whether to accept it or not. So nobody ever raised an issue about that. Furthermore, Aisha was, was not kidnapped, hashalillah, or molested, or whatever the kind of terms they use. She was married with the approval of and blessing of her parents, both her parents. Would anyone give his daughter for anyone, anyone, no matter who he is, to molest her? And they loved her so dearly. And Abu Bakr was a rich and very powerful man. He was a very wise man. He's not an, a walkover type of person. Furthermore, when people say, you yeah, know, but that's illegal. That's illegal. It's less than 16 or 18. They say, according to whose law? Even in some Western countries, I've seen a piece on the internet that says in the United States, even in the later part of the 19th century, there was no restriction in terms of the age of marriage. That some people married at the age of 12. Girls sometimes were married at the age of 12. Later on, some states began to introduce upper, you know, minimum marital age of 14, and then it increased to 16. In some places, 18 or 16 with the approval of the guardian. These are laws, secular laws. The Islamic law requires only one condition, that both parties reach majority, become adolescent. And to say that it is impossible everywhere in all times for a girl who is nine years old to, to reach adolescence, I think that is not necessarily a correct statement. Having said all of that, there's something that's rather interesting. That this, the, the question of the age of Aisha at the time of marriage, while it appears in Bukhari, it is not words of the Prophet. You see, the, be careful. Muslims sometimes use the term hadith. Hadith. Hadith can be used to refer to words of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And when you challenge that or raise an issue, it's a more serious issue. But hadith also has been used to refer to statements by the companions of the Prophet or people close to him like Aisha. None of these three hadiths in Bukhari is the word of the Prophet to start with. They're all attributed to statements made by Aisha. And Muslim, while they love and respect the household of the Prophet, never consider anyone as infallible but the Prophet himself. Whether she could have made a mistake in estimating her age, that's an issue that's open. Furthermore, some scholars of hadith has pointed out also that all of this hadith has been narrated by one particular person. And some questions are raised as to whether his narration in his old age might have been affected by his weakness of memory. This is another issue altogether. But the most interesting thing that I read myself in the Seerah of Ibn Ishaq, that is the biography of the Prophet, that's the most authentic one used by East and West alike. Western scholars also refer to it. The most ancient and the most authentic one, which was edited by Ibn Hisham. But originally, the author is Ibn Ishaq, the oldest one. Ibn Ishaq speaks about the very early Muslims. By the way, Ibn Ishaq was in no way defending the Prophet's marriages, no way trying to respond to the question raised by the Southern Baptist Convention in the United States. Has nothing to do with this. He mentioned casually in his chronology the early days of Islam, those who accepted Islam in the very early Meccan period. And then he says it includes Abu Bakr. And we know this, the first man, adult, who accepted Islam was Abu Bakr. And then he talks about people who accepted Islam but with the effort and invitation of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr accepted and he started to spread it. And he mentioned casually, it includes names like Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Uthman ibn Affan, and he says, and Asma and Aisha, daughters of Abu Bakr and Aisha was young at the time. That's rather interesting. Because we know that the, the contract, not the consummation, the contract of marriage was made in the last year of the 13-year Meccan period. And Aisha, is her name appear among the earliest Muslims who accepted Islam in the first year. So you add to that 12 or 13 years, and you add to that at least three years, a child to accept Islam. 
that seemed to point out that in all likelihood, she was at least 16 and went to the household of the Prophet at the age of 19, not six and nine. But I deliberately kept that as a last point because it could be debatable, you know, which one is more accurate historically. But it is a very powerful evidence because Ibn Ishaq, in the opinion of scholars of Hadith, is a dependable person. Some people criticize him, but people, including Imam Ahmad, one of the leaders of one of the four schools of jurisprudence, consider him to be a dependable source of Hadith. Not that he's infallible, but he is a dependable source as well. Finally, the last one. Some people basically say that the Prophet married the divorcee of his son. Her name was Zainab, and his son's name was Zaid. And not only this, they keep adding some fixing based on some unauthentic reports that appear in some histories and add their own caviar to that, more or less giving the reader the impression that the Prophet really wanted to marry Zainab. And somehow Zaid knew that the Prophet wanted to marry Zainab, even though she was married to him. So he had to divorce her so that she can observe her waiting, thank you, waiting period and then to marry her. Uh, relax, I got the notice that I have five minutes, but I promise I try to finish within that. Khalas, no problem. Okay, to answer, of course, that might give some kind of question even not only of obsession with women, it might even raise some serious moral question, you know, to really aspire to marry a woman, you know, who's already married, even if the person voluntarily divorced her, you know, it's, it's a very uncomfortable kind of situation, right, is it? In order to answer that question historically, we have to ask, who was Zaid? Who was Zainab? How did Zainab come to marry Zaid? And what happened in their marriage? And why the Prophet finally was commanded to marry her? First, who was Zaid? Zaid was not the son of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And you heard Sheikh Faisal reading the first ayah, He was not his biological son. But in Arabia, before it was outlawed in the Quran, the adoption was used, and that Zaid actually was a slave that the Prophet freed and said, he is my son, meaning adopted son. But he was not his biological son. Question, who was Zainab? And did the Prophet really discover his, her beauty all of a sudden and wanted to marry her? Many people do not realize that Zainab is the cousin of the Prophet. And they grew together as children. And he had seen her before even hijab was prescribed later in Medina. How come all of a sudden, after all this year being raised together, discovered that Zainab is beautiful? Thirdly, how did Zainab get to marry Zaid? It was actually by some pressure applied to her by the Prophet because he wanted to cancel this aristocracy. Zainab was coming from the elite tribe of Quraysh. Zaid was a former slave. But the Prophet wanted to make a good point that you look for the character of the person. So she accepted to marry Zaid. But then, what happened in their marriage? Problems. Zaid comes to complain to the Prophet that his wife is treating him you know, in a way that's too haughty, that they're not getting along. So the Prophet, like any good marriage counselor, would say, be patient. But then something very crucial, and that is actually found in Surah 33. People use their imagination without reading the Quran, which is the most authentic source of Sirah. Revelation come to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through Gabriel, to tell him, look, ultimately, Zaid is going to divorce Zainab. This marriage is not going to last. Secondly, confidential information revelation given to him that after Zaid divorces Zainab, God will command you to marry her after, after she observed the waiting period, required waiting period, to marry her in order to break the taboo in Arabia that the adopted child is exactly the same like a biological son. And the Prophet keep this information. He's not authorized to reveal it yet. So Zaid comes back to the Prophet again and complain. Our marital life is on the rocks, you know. But then the Prophet, knowing even that he will end up divorcing his wife, again 
as any good counselor would say, as the Quran say, Amsik alayka zawjaka wa taqilla, keep your wife and fear Allah. And he hides, as the Quran say, you hide in yourself what Allah is going to reveal. What was the Prophet hiding? The Prophet was hiding the information that ultimately he will be commanded to marry her. And that's why the Quran says, don't fear people, it's okay. Don't fear people. If Allah commands you, he is not your biological son. I know it was very difficult on the Prophet. That's why the Quran says, you fear people, you should fear Allah alone. Because nobody could break that taboo. You know, when you say, this is my adopted son, it has three implications. One, he takes your name. So there is a false identity. Two, he inherits on equal footing with your bio biological children. Three, he becomes exactly your biological son, which means if he's married, his wife becomes your daughter-in-law, and if he divorces her, it would be incest to get married to her. But the Quran came to say, this is false. Zaid is a stranger. He is not of the, even the tribe of the Prophet. He is not his son. And as such, that taboo has to be broken. That was the story. It is found very clearly and explicitly stated in the Quran. Now, to conclude, my basic appeal here for both Muslims and their non-Muslim brethren is to try and be objective. Try not to get influence from people who don't know what they're talking about, who have their own agenda in the media or otherwise. And even for Muslims themselves, unfortunately, sometimes, again, Islamic education is not really that sufficient to be aware of some of those issues and problems. I'm very glad and thankful to you all that I was afforded an opportunity last year to address a similarly controversial issue of the nature of relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims and verses that has been misinterpreted by one party or the other or sometimes both. I think it is this kind of objective, honest search for truth, not a partisan or aggressive or you know, antagonistic approach that would lead us all to better understanding, better appreciation, and after all, achieving more peaceful and respectful coexistence amongst ourselves. Thank you very much for your patience. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much indeed. Jazakallah, uh, Dr. Badavi, for your most enlightening and most informative lecture. No doubt there will be questions raised at the appropriate time. And if there are any questions on Qadr, predestination of fate, please come forward after the meeting finishes or after the lectures finish. Brothers and sisters, the purpose and the objective of organizing these lectures is to educate ourselves, to equip ourselves with knowledge so that we can then disseminate information, pass it on, and also use it as a defense against the onslaught towards Islam. Now, if you were to join the National Dawa program of IPCI, you will be handed out these leaflets. We have to learn to capitalize on the adverse publicity in the media against Islam. For instance, this onslaught against Islam is nothing new, as Dr. Badawi quite correctly pointed out. It started from the days of the Quraishite when Walid bin al mughira he suggested that the only thing we can say, although it's not true, against the holy personage of the Prophet Muhammad is that he is a magician because he divides families. And they then appointed publicizers to pass it on to the people coming caravans coming for pilgrimage, who then passed it on in the Arabian Peninsula. But it's amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his wisdom, in subtle ways, uses these negative efforts in favor of Islam. And today, inshallah, the same thing will happen. If you read this leaflet, it says, you owe it to yourself to find out the truth. The lies which well-meaning zeal has heaped round this man Muhammad are disgraceful to ourselves only. Who says this? Not a Muslim, but a famous British, or more appropriately, a Scottish philosopher. Since the great British philosopher made this statement over a century ago, 
there have been countless lies invented against the Holy Prophet, the religion of Islam, and the Quran, the last revelation. And it carries on, Thomas Carlyle says, the word of such a man, Muhammad, is a voice direct from nature's own heart. Men do and must listen to that as to nothing else. All else is wind in comparison, says Thomas Carlyle. And we carry on to say, for the sake of finding out the truth about Islam, the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad, we invite you to read the booklets that are advertised here free of charge. Dr. Badri mentioned about the age of Hazrat Aisha Sadiq Radillah and IPCI published this booklet some years ago. Hazrat Aisha Sadiq, a study of her age at the time of her marriage. Some copies are still available, free of charge. You can help yourself on a first come, first serve basis at the IPCI store. Now, brothers and sisters, this question about the polygamy in Islam continues to recur. And we receive so many questions about it from the non-Muslims as well as Muslims coming to IPCI. Dr. Badawi did point out that Hazrat Dawud according to the Bible, had over 100 wives. And in the Bible, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 3, we read that Prophet Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. I personally don't accept that. I think there's interpolation in the Bible. But nevertheless, it is there. He pointed out that Islam restricted the marriage, marriages to four. And there were, after these injunctions were revealed, people who had more than four wives. And they were then obliged to divorce the number that they had over four. For instance, Ghailan, one of the Taif chieftain, he had nine wives, so he divorced five. And another, Nofal bin Mavia, he had five wives, so he divorced one. But the question is, what is the spirit behind this injunction of being able to marry more than one wife? Of course, it's not obligatory. Norm, as Dr. Badawi pointed out, is only one. You see, people seem to think that marrying more than wife is for lust. And this is, it couldn't be further from the truth. The commentators tell us that the injunctions that is in Surah Nisa, Ayah 3, relating to this permission of marrying in ones, twos, threes, and fours, and which is conditional, was revealed immediately after the Battle of Uhud. In the Battle of Uhud, as we know, over 10%, that is, 70 Muslim soldiers were martyred. That represented then 10% of Muslim population in, in Medina. So 10% of the families became fatherless, the wives became widows, and the children became orphans. So now they wanted to see what solution has Islam for this. So Islam offers a solution. And not for lust, but to bring about the spirit of sacrifice. That is, a man is asked to sacrifice and take on additional responsibility of another family with orphans to offer them parental guidance, to provide them with fatherly affection, to provide them and support them with sustenance. And the wife is asked to make sacrifices by allowing her husband to take on these additional responsibilities in accordance with their capacity and with their capability. May I remind you, or at least reiterate what Sheikh Ahmad Didat used to say? He said after the Second World War, in Germany, when there was a gross surplus of women, reporters interviewed these women who were then mistresses and posed a question asking whether they would not prefer to be a second or a third or a fourth wife rather than a mistress. And they all replied in the affirmative. They, when asked as to why, they said, well, you see, if we were married, even though we are second, third, or fourth wife, nevertheless, it will be above board. We won't have to hide anything. It will, the relationship would be legal. Furthermore, 
our children will not be illegitimate. They will be legal. They will be legitimate. Our children will adopt family names. And furthermore, and perhaps more importantly, we, the wives, as well as our children, will have share in the inheritance. With this, brother and sister, I'll leave you to ponder. And we shall now, inshallah, break for Maghrib. May I point out that people who are from uh, outside Birmingham, there are mosques in the very close vicinity. Uh, just up the road on Coventry Road is Darul Uloom Mosque. But there are also facilities available here to perform Salah. There is an adjacent hall, and the brother has made the opening for you to enter through. We shall, ins inshallah, conduct a jama'ah there. S for sisters, if they go through the entrance behind uh, where it says the fire exit and carry straight along, there is another smaller hall, catering hall, where they can say their salah. There is also provision for the sisters to have, uh, make their salah here if they so wish. We shall, inshallah, now retire and resume this session at 9.20. That is 20 past 9, inshallah. See you at 20 past 9, inshallah.